Heat and calorimetry are going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now, this is the first lesson in a chapter on thermodynamics, and uh, truth be told, I've actually combined two chapters into one. I just thought it kind of flowed a little better that way, so if you look at the numbers and you're like, what's going on with this whole 11-12 thing? Well, it's two chapters combined into one. So. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk about heat. We're going to talk about some different ways to transfer heat. Uh, and then we're going to get into some of the calculations involving like specific heat and the latent heats of fusion and vaporization. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. All right, so we're gonna start off with some vocabulary here, and we're gonna start off with simply the definition of heat. And heat is simply the transfer of energy between a system and a surroundings due to a difference in temperature. Heat gets transferred from whatever is at a higher temperature to whatever is at a lower temperature. Uh, and that transfer will continue uh, either till they're not in thermal contact or until they've reached thermal equilibrium, i.e. they're at the same temperature. Now, we've got three different ways in which that heat might be transferred. And the first is conduction or thermal conduction. Uh, and this is when there's two objects that vary in temperature are brought into direct contact. And uh, if you recall kind of at the molecular level here, so we're going to find out that thermal conduction is really the exchange of kinetic energy at the, the molecular level. So atoms and molecules are moving around. And so say you've got, uh, you know, two solids. So and in solids, uh, you know, the atoms and molecules aren't flowing like they would be in a liquid and they're not as spread out as they would be in a gas and things of a sort, not moving as fast, but they are vibrating around and the higher the temperature, the greater the amplitude of these vibrations and things of a sort. And so what happens when you bring, bring two objects that are in uh, uh, different temperatures in direct contact is the one that's hotter, the vibrations are greater and where they're in contact, those molecules will start bouncing into the molecules of the other one, causing them to bounce faster and in a way, Ultimately, some of that kinetic energy is going to get transferred from that hotter rod to the colder one, if you will. Uh, and in such a way, again, greater kinetic energy is associated with greater temperature. So that's one way we, heat can be transferred through thermal conduction. Uh, and the next is convection. So in convection is the transfer of heat due to the motion of a fluid. It doesn't technically have to be a fluid, but it's almost always going to be a fluid in any example you see. And by fluid, we mean either liquid or gas. So, and this can be natural, uh, you know, hot air tends to rise and so heat can get transferred that way. So, but also we have convection ovens in which the air is kind of blown around your food and things of a sort. And so you get kind of forced convection instead. Uh, and then finally, we've got radiation. And so heat can also be transmitted uh, through electromagnetic radiation. So if you take a look at your uh, typical you know, coil on your stove and stuff like that, when you heat it up and it turns bright orange, the fact that it's changing colors means it's emitting electromagnetic radiation. And in this case, it's emitting electromagnetic radiation that's in the visible spectrum. That's why your eyes can see it. But it's not limited only to the visible spectrum. So, and when that electromagnetic radiation is given off uh, and comes in contact with some other object. So, the uh, electromagnetic radiation can cause electronic transitions and vibrational transitions and stuff like that. And ultimately the net result is that the atoms or molecules in absorbing the energy of that electromagnetic radiation are gonna be vibrating a little bit faster, i.e. have greater kinetic energy, i.e. have a higher temperature. All right, so that's the three primary ways we're gonna be transferring energy. And now we're gonna get into the nuts and bolts of this lesson, talking about uh, some of the calculations involved with calorimetry. And we've gotta start with a discussion on specific heats. And, the classic equation here is Q equals MC delta T, where C here is what we call the specific heat. So, and the specific heat is, is characteristic of a substance, and specifically, it is the amount of heat required to raise one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. If you rearrange this equation here and solve for C, you can see that C is gonna equal Q over M times delta T. And so in this case, you can see that it's the amount of heat, Q, symbol for heat, so per one gram per one degree Celsius. So the amount of heat required to weighs one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius. All right, so if we take a look at this equation, it's really got four variables, or really three variables and a constant, if you will. So, but the constant depends on what substance you have. So in that context, I guess, depending on the substance, you could look at that as also a variable. So, but with four uh, variables in that case, uh, you need three and you can calculate the other one. And that's typically the context in which this is brought up, at least initially. You can get a little more complicated after that though. So, but in this case, you can see that the heat is proportional to the mass. So if you wanna, you know, raise the temperature, not just of one gram of a substance, but say of 10 grams of a substance, one degree Celsius. 
Well, if it's now 10 times as much of that substance, it should take 10 times as much heat. And that makes intuitive sense, and that's exactly right. So the heat is proportional to the mass of the substance. So same thing on the other side. Well, what if you, instead of, you know, let's go back to having one gram of that substance. Well, what if instead of, of raising its temperature by one degree Celsius, you want to raise its temperature by 10 degrees Celsius? Well, if you want the temperature to go up by a factor of 10, you know, 10 times greater than before, well, that's going to require 10 times as much heat. And that's exactly right. And again, this makes intuitive sense. Uh, intuitive sense. The, the amount of heat required is proportional to the temperature change you want to achieve. So, and then the specific heat is just some intrinsic constant associated with a certain substance. So substances that have rather high specific heats would be an example like water. And it takes a lot of heat to change the temperature of water. Whereas on the other case, you know, uh, metals tend to have lower specific heats. So if you, if I, you know, I live in Arizona and it's really hot in the summer. And if you're out in the middle of August, I like to tell my students and say, you know, if I gave you the option to sit on an aluminum park bench in the middle of the day, in the middle of August, when it's 115 degrees outside, or to sit in an, an analogous, uh, you know, kiddie pool full of water where the weight of that water is exactly the same as the weight of that aluminum park bench. Which would you choose? So, and a lot of people understand intuitively that, yeah, that park bench is going to be scalding hot. And here's the deal. So which one of the, those two, they're out, you know, right out in the middle of the sun, in the middle of the same Arizona heat in August, 115 degrees Celsius, or 150 degrees Celsius, 115 degrees Fahrenheit day. So they get the same heat in this case, and some of that heat's coming in the form of radiation from the sun, some of it from convection of the air around it. So it's coming in a variety of forms and stuff like that, but they're getting a lot of heat and they're getting the same amount of heat. So in this case, being in the same environment. They had the same mass, that was a key, I said that the, the weight of the water in the kiddie pool was exactly the same as the weight, uh, or in this case, mass of the aluminum park bench. So, but the temperature change is not gonna be the same. So they both receive the same heat and have the same mass, but we inherently know that the aluminum park bench is gonna be at a way higher temperature because it's change in temperatures way higher with the same amount of heat and the same mass. And the reason it's got a much higher change in temperature is because it's got a much lower specific heat. And initially that seems unintuitive. So, but again, the specific heat is the amount of heat it takes to change the temperature one degree. Well, with aluminum, it takes a lot less heat than water to change its temperature one degree. And as a result, if you add the same amount of heat to water and aluminum in the same masses, the aluminum is going to go way higher in temperature. That's why you want to sit in the kiddie pool and not on the aluminum park bench, or at least one of the main reasons. So let's take a look at doing a couple sample calculations with this. And let's take a look at raising the temperature of one gram of aluminum versus one gram of water. And so in this case, I'm going to add 100 joules just to make a nice round number. I'm not going to worry about sig figs for the purpose of this calculation, by the way, in any respect. So, and we're going to raise one gram of aluminum, one degree Celsius, and calculate the corresponding delta T. And then we're going to add 100 joules to one gram of water so, and calculate the corresponding delta T. But the big thing that's going to be different between the two is the specific heat we plug in. And if you look up that specific heat for aluminum, you're going to find it's 0 0.90 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And if you look it up for water, it's 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And so what you're going to find is that because water's uh, specific heat is roughly four times larger than aluminum's, with a four times larger specific heat, it's going to have a four times smaller delta T, again with the heat and the mass of each used being exactly the same. So let's let our calculator do some work for us here. So in this case, we can see that if we just divide 100 by 0 0.9, we're going to get 111. And so in this case, delta T for the aluminum is 111 degrees Celsius. Whereas in the case of the water, we've got 100 divided by 4.18. And we're going to get 23.9 degrees Celsius instead. And we can see again with, with water specific heat being roughly a little bit more than four times bigger than aluminum's, its delta T is a little more than four times smaller than aluminum's as well. But that's kind of how specific heat works. Now, one thing we gotta realize here is that when you're adding heat to a substance, its temperature generally goes up, except for a couple examples of when it doesn't. So, and the, the key is that it doesn't when it's going through a phase change. So when you go from say a solid to a liquid, so melting, which we call fusion in technical terms, or when you're going from say a liquid to a gas. So boiling or vaporization in more technical terms. So it turns out as you're adding heat, uh, right at the phase change temperature. So if you're water, 
and you've been heating up some ice, let's say, and you're heating up the ice and the temperature goes up. You add more heat and the temperature goes up. But once you reach zero degrees Celsius, the, the melting or freezing temperature of water, at that temperature, all of a sudden, you're gonna be adding more heat and the temperature is just gonna sit right at zero degrees Celsius. And it turns out some of the heat, uh, or all the heat in that case, is, is you can use to break up some of the intermolecular forces that hold that ice together. And so in this case, instead of actually raising the overall kinetic energy of the molecules, it's breaking some of the intermolecular attractive forces instead at the phase change. And that's what happens at a phase change. And that's why the temperature overall is not changing So uh, at the phase changes. And so we gotta have a way of quantifying how much heat this is. And we call these the latent heats. And so we have the latent heat of fusion and the latent heat of vaporization, symbolized by the letter L here. So latent heat of fusion, latent heat of vaporization, and you can look these up for a variety of different substances, and turns out water's values are fairly large compared to some other substances and things of a sort. So, but they're just quantified. They're in thermodynamics tables. You can look them up. You can Google them, things of a sort. If you want to know what it is for water, great. You want to know what it is for aluminum, great. You want to know what it is for just about any given substance, you can find values for these. So in the last examples here, we made an assumption that we weren't actually going through a phase change. So assuming we had solid aluminum the entire time of this span of 111 degrees, life is good and, and no adjustment would need to be made to that calculation. And assume the water in this case was staying in the liquid phase because it turns out these specific heats are also uh, peculiar to the phase. If you're talking about solid water, ice, liquid water, or gaseous water, i.e. steam, they all have different specific heat values. And as long as you're not crossing, you know, one of the phase change temperatures, then you're good just to use, you know, simple Q equals MC delta T to calculate out that temperature change. But if you cross one of those phase change boundaries, the phase change temperatures for a substance, all of a sudden now you've got to factor in these latent heats of fusion or vaporization. Now here in this case, I've set this up kind of uh, for adding heat to cause melting or adding heat to cause boiling, but it can go the other way around. If you're adding heat to cause a substance to melt or boil, well, what if you do the opposite? So the opposite of boiling is condensation, where you go from gas to liquid. Well, in that case, it releases heat. You're still gonna look up the latent heat of vaporization, but it's the negative of that value. Instead of being a positive amount of heat required that's being absorbed by that substance in order to boil, now it's gonna be the amount of heat that's being released, and you'll just take the negative uh, of the latent heat of vaporization. So if you wanted the heat associated with condensation, it's just the negative of the latent heat of vaporization. Same thing on the fusion side. If, if instead of adding heat to a solid to cause it to melt, what if instead it's, you have a liquid that's freezing? Well, upon freezing, and it seems a little counterintuitive, but that substance actually releases heat. So and by releasing the heat, it ends up in a state where it has less overall energy, if you will. And that might make a little more sense intuitively. So. And we might call this uh, either freezing or crystallization. In such a process, the, the, the latent heat associated with it is just the negative of the latent heat of fusion. So we need to take a look at what's called a heating curve. Let's make a little room. Okay, so we're going to make a plot here of temperature versus Q heat. We call this a heating curve. And we're going to start in the solid phase. And we're going to take a look at this in the context of, say, water. So it turns out if you add heat to ice starting in that solid phase, the temperature of that ice is going to go up all the way up until a point where it reaches a phase change temperature. So in this case, the melting temperature. And in the case of water at uh, uh, one atmosphere pressure, that would be zero degrees Celsius. And all of a sudden you're gonna keep adding heat and the temperature is all of a sudden gonna plateau and it's not gonna change. So, but at some point that temperature is gonna start going back up again. And then once again, it is going to plateau yet again. So, and we call this the boiling temperature. So, and again, you're adding heat, adding heat, and the temperature is no longer changing, but at some point it will eventually start changing again and going back up. So once you see these plateaus on the heating curve, that's the evidence you're going through the phase change. And so here we'd have fusion going on. So the heat associated with that would be the latent heat of fusion. So here we've got vaporization and the heat associated with that's the latent heat of vaporization. Cool, and, and this idea that you know using Q equals MC delta T to calculate heat, well, as long as you're not going through a phase change, that totally works. So right here, so Q equals MC delta T, that totally works. We're adding heat and we're getting a corresponding temperature change and we're not crossing through any sort of phase change within this region. Same thing right here. So here we've got Q equals MC delta T in the liquid phase. And then here we've got Q equals MC 
delta T in the gaseous phase. And again, the big thing we gotta remember is that the specific heat of the solid, the liquid, and the gas of a substance are all different. And so if you're crossing phase boundaries, you've gotta potentially look up multiple specific heat values to solve a particular calculation. All right, so now in this case, with the latent heat of fusion, the latent heat of vaporization, uh, the SI units for those are gonna be given in joules per kilogram. Joules per kilogram, so if you wanna calculate Q there, you're gonna to have to multiply by the corresponding number of kilograms, the mass. And so now if you're looking at doing a calculation of how much heat it causes to raise the temperature of some substance from you know, A to B, so or T initial to T final, if you will, so you've gotta take into context, am I crossing through any phase changes? And, and factor that in. So if the example calculation we're gonna look at here, says how much heat would be required to raise 500.0 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius to 50.0 degrees Celsius. So we're starting with ice down here at negative 20 degrees Celsius or negative 20.0 technically degrees Celsius. And we're gonna want to raise that temperature up to 50 degrees Celsius. Well, 50 degrees Celsius would be way up here. And so in this case, yeah, we're definitely gonna to have to cross through the melting temperature. We have to melt this ice and then heat it up as a liquid. And so what you're gonna to have to do is calculate the heat associated first with getting it up to its melting temperature. And we'll use Q equals MC delta T to calculate that out. Then we're gonna to have to melt all that ice at zero degrees Celsius. And we'll use the latent heat of fusion to calculate that out. And then once all the ice is melted, now we're gonna to have to heat up the liquid that we have up to the 50 degrees Celsius from the zero degrees Celsius. And we'll once again use Q equals MC delta T to calculate that. And so we can see that we've actually got three parts to this calculation, part one, part two, and part three. And parts one and three use Q equals MC delta T, but part two is gonna use that latent heat of fusion uh, in order to do it. So in this particular question, I provided all the different thermodynamic quantities for water. I provided the specific heat of ice, liquid water, and steam, just in case it was needed. Uh, and also provided the latent heats of fusion and vaporization, just in case it was needed. But in this particular problem, we're not gonna need the latent heat of vaporization or the specific heat of steam, uh, since we're not crossing 100 degrees Celsius for water, it's boiling point. All right, so let's do some calculations. I'm just gonna break this up into three parts, part one, part two, part three. So, and we're definitely gonna use Q equals MC delta T for parts one and part three. And then we're gonna use Q equals M times the latent heat of fusion for part two. All right, so we're told we got 500 grams of a substance. So on the nice table provided here for the specific heat of ice for this first part. So is 2.09 joules per gram degree Celsius. Uh, and in this case, we're going from negative 20 degrees Celsius to start up to the melting temperature of zero degrees Celsius. And delta T is always final minus initial. So you could say it's zero minus negative 20, which is just gonna end up being positive 20 degrees Celsius change for delta T. All right, I like doing the similar parts at the same time and they're gonna look similar to start. So it's 500 grams. Specific heat of liquid water, same one we used a little bit ago is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So, and now we're going in this part, part three, from zero degrees Celsius up to 50 degrees Celsius. And so again, delta T is final minus initial, and so it'd be 50 minus zero, which is just positive 50 degrees Celsius change. So note that your temperature changes are positive if the temperature is going up, like it is in these cases. It would be negative if the temperature were going down, and the signs do matter, they're really important. All right, so finally we can let our calculator do some work for us, but let's set up the last one here too. And so in this case, 500 grams, uh, we need the mass in kilograms. So 500 grams divided by 1,000 is 0 0.5 kilograms. And the latent heat of fusion is provided as 3.33 times 10 to the fifth joules per kilogram. And now we're ready to let our calculator do some work for us. All right, so 500 times 2.09 times 20, it's gonna get us 20,900 joules. Now let's see, how many sig figs did we have in our numbers here? It looks like three sig figs, so good to go there. All right, and then this one here, so 0 0.5 times 3 point, well, I can't do two decimal points in a row, 3.33 times 10 to the fifth. 
That's going to be uh, 166,500, so 166,500. And you know what? I'm going to leave this just like this. And once I add them together, I'll finally combine it into three sig figs at the end. Uh, actually, I'm probably going to change that. Uh, if I want to do this properly, I should actually make that three sig figs right here. And then when I add them, I'll have to worry about that later. All right. So 500 times 4.18 times 50. Now we're going to get 104,500, which to three sig figs, I'll round up to 105,000. And so now I put these all together in Q total. So 20,900 plus 167,000 plus 105,000 uh, is 142,600. But let's get the sig figs right. So when you're doing addition here, so we can see that this one has sig figs all the way down to the thousands place. This one all the way to the thousands place. This one all the way to the hundreds place. And when you're adding multiple numbers together like this, so you can only get as exact as your least exact number. Well, getting more exact to the hundreds place is more exact than to the thousands place. So we're only gonna be able to get as exact to the thousands place. We'll have to round it right there. And so in this case, that's gonna be rounding up to 143,000 joules for the total heat required to raise 500 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius up to 50 degrees Celsius. All right, the last example here says that 50.0 grams of iron at 80.0 degrees Celsius is placed into 50.0 grams of water at 20.0 degrees Celsius. What is the final temperature of the mixture when thermal equilibrium is reached? And then specific heats of both iron and liquid water are provided in parentheses. All right, so let's map this out here. We've got 50.0 grams of iron at initial temperature of 80 degrees Celsius. We've got 50.0 grams of water at 20.0 degrees Celsius. And in this case, we can kind of map this out and see pretty easily that when you mix the two, there's gonna be a transfer of heat due to a difference in temperature. And in this case, the temperature of the iron is gonna to have to come down and the temperature of the water is going to have to come up. And they're gonna meet in the middle somewhere. Now you might be like, well, there's 50 grams of both, Chad, so shouldn't they just meet like right halfway in the middle? So, well, if they were the same substance, that would be true. If this was 50 grams of water up here and 50 grams of water down here, then yeah, the specific heat of water is the same in both cases for liquid water, or at least roughly the same. It turns out there is some, some temperature fluctuations that we usually don't factor in at this level. So, but that being the case, if these were both 50 grams of water, equal masses, same substance, then yes, it would meet exactly in the middle and exactly in the middle of 80 and 20 would be 50 but they're not exactly the same. The specific heat of iron is way lower than the specific heat of water. So in this case, the specific heat of iron given is 0.45 joules per gram degree Celsius. The specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. With the specific heat of water being roughly 10 times higher, almost 10 times higher, so it means it takes a lot more heat to change the temperature of the water. And so as a result, as there's a, a heat transfer from the iron to the water, the iron, it's gonna be the same heat. The, the heat, the water, the iron's given off is the same heat the water is gonna absorb. So it's the same heat for both substances, but we're gonna find that there's gonna be a much larger temperature change for that iron because it has a much smaller specific heat. It takes a lot less heat to undergo a temperature change, if you will, for the iron. So ultimately, the approach you wanna take here is in a system like this, so in the transfer of heat, is that the sum of the heats adds up to zero. So the heat given off by one substance is absorbed by another substance, and if you have more than two substances, the total amount of heat being transferred among the, all, all the parties still has to add up to zero. Some are gaining, some are losing, but it's the same heat that's being transferred around. And so in this case, we could say that the heat of the iron plus the heat of the water adds up to zero. Now in the case of the iron, the iron's gonna be given off heat. When we calculate it out, we're gonna find out that its Q is negative. It's giving off the heat, it's losing the heat whereas the water is going to be absorbing the heat as its temperature goes up. And so as a result, we'll find out that, that value, it's going to be a positive value associated with heat. It's gaining the heat. But the negative value here and the positive value here are going to have the same magnitude so that they add up to zero. All right, so if we set this up, so here it's just an MC delta T in both cases. So for the iron, we're going to have the mass of the iron, the specific heat of the iron, and then the delta T of the iron, which is going to be T final minus T initial for the iron. So, and then plus the mass of the water, and I guess I should label that appropriately as well. 
times the specific heat of the liquid water times its corresponding temperature change. So, and again, the truth be told is if we gotta keep in mind that this is the temperature change associated with the iron, this is the temperature change associated with the water. And, uh, and a reason I, I wanna bring that out is that the final temperature ultimately is going to be the same, but the initial temperature is not the same. So if I just label this as TI and TI, I might get confused and think, oh, it's the same value. No, 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 it's not the same value. The initial temperatures are different. So, and I could call this TI, you know, iron and TI water or something like that. I'm just gonna kind of keep it in mind here. So we're ready to do some plugging and chugging. So again, it's 50.0 grams in both cases. Specific heat of the iron was 0 0.45 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So, and then we're gonna have T final minus the 80 degrees Celsius. Plus 50 grams of water. Specific heat 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And then finally, T final minus the 20 degrees Celsius equals zero. And you can see now we've got one equation and the only variable we don't know is that final temperature showing up at a couple places, but still the only variable we don't know. And so in this case, we start combining some things here. So 50 times 0.45 is 22.5. So we're gonna have 22.5 times TF and then also times the negative 80. which is gonna be minus 1800. I'm gonna leave off the units for a little bit here. So then 50 times 4.18. And that's 209, and so it's 209 times TF. Distribute it through here. And then times negative 20. It's gonna be minus 4180. equals zero, and now we can combine like terms and solve for TF here. So 22.5 plus 209, which I guess we could have done in our head. Uh, yeah, except when you plug in times instead of plus here. So 22.5 plus 209 is 231.5. At least I recognize the answer wasn't correct there. So 231.5 times TF equals, we'll move these to the other side. So uh, negative 4180 minus 1800, but we'll be adding them to the other side. So 4180 plus 1800. We're going to get 5980. So, and finally we'll divide through by that 231.5. And in this case, we're going to get 25.83 degrees Celsius. We got to take this to, looks like three sig figs. Uh, so 25.8. And this answer might be a little bit surprising. You might be like, hey, we had equal masses, Chad, remember? And 20 degrees Celsius for the water, 80 degrees Celsius for the iron. Why is that final temperature so much closer to 20 than it is to 80? Well, again, if you look at what these delta T's mean, well, for well, the water's case, the, the temperature is just going up a little over five degrees. In the case of the iron, it's going down almost 55 degrees, almost 10 times more, again, because it had a specific heat that was almost 10 times less than that of water. Again, a lower specific heat means you're going to get a corresponding larger temperature change, uh, all else being equal. And that's exactly what we see here with that final temperature. We're going to have to be 25.8 degrees Celsius. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.